MR-7 booster is prepared for shipment from Marshall Space Flight Center to Cape Canaveral as a prelude to the free world's first suborbital man in space flight. The precision tailored booster is carefully loaded and is carefully transported on its 631 mile journey. As this plane touches down at Cape Canaveral, the booster has reached its destination. The flight booster was conceived and designed at Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville and fabricated by Chrysler Corporation in Detroit. Now it is at Cape Canaveral to achieve its purpose, to thrust the Freedom 7 capsule into space. The booster arrives and is transported to Hangar D on the Cape, where it will remain in temporary storage until time for its erection on the launch pad. Here, the booster is visually inspected for irregularities which may have occurred in transit. Also, the booster is weighed to obtain its actual dry weight prior to erection on the launch pad. On April 10, the booster was transported to Pad 5 for erection. After the booster is erected, preliminary flight checks are begun. Power is applied to the booster. Air and jet vanes are installed. All booster systems are checked. All pressure systems are checked. Functional checks are made on the automatic abort system, on the command destruct system, on the navigation, and on the gyro system. At this time, the cable mast for the capsule is erected. While preliminary checks are performed on the booster, final checks are made on the capsule at Hangar S. Colonel John Glenn, one of the astronauts, helps to perform these checks. These include overall checks on the abort, attitude, electrical, pressure, and control systems. Commander Shepard also helps to perform these checks. The periscope is checked for proper operation. The retro and posi-grade rocket packs are installed. The escape rocket is mated and checked. All systems are made ready for mating to the booster. On April 15th, the capsule was transported to Pad 5 for mating to the booster. After the mechanical compatibility of the booster capsule has been verified, the electrical connection of the capsule to the booster and to the support equipment is checked. Capsule subsystems are checked, followed by booster capsule interface and RF interference checks. Overall instrumentation tests on range, complex, booster, and capsule are checked. After interface checks are finished, Overall tests are begun between range and blockhouse. Bob Moser of the Launch Operations Directorate, a division of Marshall Space Flight Center, is the test conductor. During these tests, all systems of the launch vehicle are checked. The launch crew that Moser heads up, under the direction of Dr. Kurt Debus, is also the crew that launched America's first satellite, the monkeys Abel and Baker and the chimp Ham. With man aboard, extra precautions have to be taken on and near the launching pad prior to liftoff of the vehicle. Pad safety has to protect not only the launching crew, but also the astronaut. To accomplish this, a special pad rescue operation has been organized. Once the service structure is removed, an emergency egress must be provided for the astronaut should an internal capsule emergency arise such as a capsule fire, a hydrogen peroxide leak, or an urgent psychological problem. This emergency egress is provided by a special rescue vehicle called Cherry Picker, which hovers near the capsule. Also, the service structure can be remotely controlled to move back to the booster. If the emergency is such that the astronaut has to abort the mission by using the capsule escape mechanism, a special rescue team will recover him from his landing point. This would be accomplished by using the Lark, a rubber-tired vehicle 
that can maneuver on both water and land, and by one of several helicopters, which are stationed at various points near the launch complex danger zone. In case an emergency arises on the launch complex itself, an M113 personnel carrier with pad safety and medical personnel in it is stationed near the blockhouse for rapid access to the launch vehicle. This vehicle can travel through fire and near a large explosion without danger to onboard personnel. The count is now T minus 390 minutes. Preparations are proceeding according to plan for loading liquid oxygen and fuel for the flight. While the fuel is being loaded, frequent measurements are taken to ensure proper quantities. The count is normal at T minus 340 minutes with the booster destruct system now being connected. This is an explosive system that can be used to destroy the booster in flight in the event of erratic motions in order to protect the population on the ground. T minus 265 minutes and the service structure is being moved back to take RF measurements between the launch vehicle and the Atlantic missile range. This mission accomplished, the service structure is returned to the launch vehicle as the count proceeds to T minus 185 minutes without interruption. Final preparations are now underway to receive the astronaut. At T minus 120 minutes, verification of readiness has been received. The astronaut has arrived and is making his way from the van to the booster. Shepard is now ready to enter the capsule. minus 105 minutes and the capsule is ready to be sealed for flight. At this time, the last door on the instrument compartment is sealed and normal cooling begun. The cherry picker is moved to the launch position and the operator stationed in the blockhouse. The count has proceeded to T minus 15 minutes and they have a hold. This hold was called due to cloud cover over the launch area. The hold lasted 15 minutes. And as the count was about to be picked up, a booster difficulty occurred. Frequency variations in the inverter extended the hold for another hour. The count is picked up again at T minus 15 minutes. After obtaining Dr. Debus OK for launch, the count proceeds to T minus five minutes when a hold is called for the trajectory computer of the Goddard Center. After a rerun of tapes between the Mercury Control Center and Goddard, an OK from the range, the count is resumed at T minus 2 minutes 30 seconds. Firing command, 30, mark. Roger, periscope has retracted. Uh, confirm, periscope retract. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Lift off. Oh, Roger. Lift off and the 
clock has started. Okay, Jose, you're on your way. Sir, reading you loud and clear. All right, same you. Many months prior to the first flight of the Mercury Redstone vehicle, preparations were started to find the most practical method for recovery of the astronaut. A recovery team under the direction of Space Task Group was formed and recovery studies were started. A positive recovery system had to be fabricated that would ensure a safe descent of the capsule with the astronaut aboard. Once the capsule was in the water, a fast means was needed to locate it. Thought was given to high-flying aircraft and a fleet of the fastest ships in the Navy. This led to the use of a fleet of helicopters operating from an aircraft carrier in the recovery zone. Once the capsule is located, the helicopters are dispatched for recovery operations. Recovery accomplished, the capsule is returned to the flight deck of the carrier. In the recovery plan, the astronaut could either stay in the capsule or could leave it and come aboard the recovery helicopter. This, Commander Shepard chose to do. Once on the carrier, the first of the medical debriefing sessions is started. This entailed a medical checkup and the removal of the sensors that were attached to Commander Shepard's body prior to the start of his flight. After this, medical inspection is completed. And after a brief rest, Commander Shepard makes preparations to leave the carrier, taking with him a certificate of his first space flight. The trip to Grand Bahama Island was uneventful and short. Among the first to greet him are his fellow astronauts.
Everyone at Grand Bahama Island, including the cooks, are prepared to give Commander Shepard a welcome home in the form of a well-prepared dinner, consisting of roast prime ribs of beef with all the trimmings. After all the medical checkups are completed, Commander Shepard has a date in Washington, D.C. with the press and a meeting with the President of the United States.